Greetings and salutations, Tim Mendes here, coming to you from the back room of Ye old Innsmouth Bookshop. Now, the other night, after some uh, New Year's Eve revelry with Mr Zadok Allen, I'd repaired to the back room to read a book before I went to sleep. And I happened upon a tome entitled Fritz Leiber and H.P. Lovecraft, Writers of the Dark, from Wildside Press, uh, edited by Ben J.S. Szemski and S.T. Yoshi. Surprise, surprise, they, they all seem to be edited by S.T. Yoshi, uh, but there you go. Uh, this is an absolutely brilliant tome. It collects the, the remaining letters uh, that Lovecraft sent to Fritz and John Kill Leiber. It also contains many of Fritz Leiber's Cthulhuvian, or Lovecraftian, stories and poems. Uh, the complete list is Adept's Gambit, The Demons of the Upper Air, The Sunken Land, Diary in the Snow, The Dreams of Albert Morland, The Dead Men, A Bit of the Dark World, To Arkham and the Stars, and terror from the depths. It's well worth picking up just for those and the letters, but tucked away in the back is a collection of 10 essays that Fritz Leiber wrote about H.P. Lovecraft. Now, I'm going to read you one of these now. Uh, I picked up... It's one of the shorter ones, and it's, a, it's an essay that he wrote in 1958 on his correspondence with H.P. Lovecraft. So this is basically Fritz's memoir of his time talking to HPL. So without further ado, I'll give you a little bit of a reading. This is Fritz Leiber with My Correspondence with H.P. Lovecraft. I read The Colour Out of Space when it first appeared in Amazing Stories, and its dismal grey horror chilled my dreams for weeks. Some years later, I gulped down in two nights most of Lovecraft's published stories, preserved in magazine tear sheets by a college acquaintance. I read The Shadow Out of Time and At the Mountains of Madness when they came out in Astounding Stories. These tales gave me a wonder, mystery and delightful terror I found in no other writing. They were sensational, yet studious, weird as a theosophist's cosmos and yet with no touch of charlatanry. It was the dream come true of meeting the mysterious scholar who tells one, yes, there are forbidden books, secret cults, undreamed eras of history, non-human intelligences, and all the rest of it. I imagine this acute effect was due to the channeling, both in me and the stories, of several powers, discounted mystical aspects of a hampered sexual urge, the wonder of science beyond all dull textbooks and elementary laboratory courses the culturally deep-rooted love and dread of secret societies, the intoxication of metaphysics, the simple joy of excitement and surprise which Lovecraft himself referred to as adventurous expectancy. In 1936, these stories had maintained their spell over me to such a degree that I was searching second-hand magazine stores for them, chiefly to have them for re-reading and permanent possession. Though there were a few I had missed, I remember purchasing for Forrest J. Ackerman tear sheets of the Silver Key and the Whisperer in the Darkness. Then in the late summer, my wife, with a bold directness I had been unable to conceive for myself, wrote a letter to H.P. Lovecraft, Care of Weird Tales. A few days later, the great man replied with what we thought was a long letter, until we had received some of his average size communications. That was the beginning of an orgy of letter-writing which lasted the few short months until his death. My wife wrote more letters herself, and shortly we were joined by my friend and fellow enthusiast for the fantastic Harry O. Fisher, then of Louisville, Kentucky. Our letters were returned to us by Mrs. Gamwell afterwards. The entire correspondence was excerpted by Derleth for the volume of letters, and later borrowed and retained, permanently as yet, by another individual who shall remain nameless here. The first things that struck me about Lovecraft from his letters were the wide range of his interests and his courteousness and great helpfulness. Always tactful, yet always ready. In his first letter he recalled at length my father's spirited Philip Falconbridge, in a performance of King John in the early century, and quoted in full the speech that begins, This England never did, nor never shall, lie at the proud foot of a conqueror. When I merely mentioned to him my intention of writing a novel set in Roman times, he sent me several thousand words of highly pertinent advice, 
including a longer and shorter bibliography for researching the period. Now, setting to work on such a novel 20 years later, I am helped by his remembered instructions. An ancient Rome, I discovered then, was the historical period with which Lovecraft identified himself most intensely, next to Restoration England. Lovecraft's famous handwriting, which packed so many words onto a page or card, yearning towards all four edges, sometimes by way of interlineations and balloons, was only superficially crabbed and difficult. Every tiny graceful hieroglyph for the simpler words was abbreviated and shaped exactly the same each time, with a bit of practice his handwriting made for a fast, easy read. Lovecraft was a writer in many senses, not all of them current. In particular, the production of many pages of fine, impromptu prose each day, chiefly in letters, was to him the breath of life. He asked to see my own writing, none of it published, as soon as I told him about it. I sent him a long fantasy and a set of poems. The Demons of the Upper Air, he praised and criticised both in detail, correcting each spelling error and carefully debating each dubious word choice. He was particularly hard on such ponderous affectations as activate for move. The fantasy was afterwards published by Arkham House as Adept's Gambit in my collection Knight's Black Agents. This action on his part, crazily generous by hard-headed standards, influenced me permanently towards greater care in the polishing and final preparation of manuscripts. His criticisms were not solely literary. When I praised Charles Fort for poking holes in scientific theories, he replied at once with a carefully revisioned, convincing defence of the dogmatism of the professional scientist. Fort's books, he said, were not to be taken seriously, though amusing enough and a great source of materials for the writer of fantasy and science fiction. And he was unsparingly, and I think excessively critical of his own writings, quite as harsh, in fact, as Edmund Wilson. He thought most of his stories were laboured, unhumorous, wanting in lively human portraits, and heavy with a sort of pseudo-realism and with intentional partial repetitions designed to build atmosphere. He told me of his practice of disavowing from time to time stories which he found aesthetically wanting, and he sent me a list, of which I still have a copy, of stories not disavowed as yet. Herbert West Reanimator was still on the list, but he said it was about to get the axe. For my part, I think Lovecraft, besides writing some excellent short stories somewhat in the manners of Poe, Dunsany, Macken, Hoffman and Bulwer-Lytton, and in addition to giving fiction with solid New England background a unique spectral note, did more than any other author to establish the science fiction story as a vehicle for supernatural horror. A clear-cut and valid story form. Occasionally overshadowed by timelier, catchier, more chameleon-like fantasy and science fiction, such tales as The Whisper in the Darkness, The Dunwich Horror, The Colour Out of Space, The Shadow Out of Time, and the dreams in the witch house will live. Besides setting me in his letters an enduring example of honest scholarly criticism, Lovecraft did something of equal importance for my future. He circulated the fantasy and poems I sent him amongst several other congenial correspondents. As a result, I met Robert Bloch, Henry Kuttner, and later several other writers in the fantasy field. I came to think of myself as at least potentially a professional author. Lovecraft is somewhat thought of having been a lonely man. He made my life far less lonely, not only during the brief half-year of our correspondence, but during the twenty years after. Yet those six precious months did have a special magic. Here are some examples. Inspired by Lovecraft's stories, I produced several pictures in a medium I called splatter stencil. Starfield splattered on black paper silhouette, monstrous forms and structures. I sent a set to Lovecraft, and he liked them. And I recall I was going to play Scapio Africanus in a drama about Hannibal that had a short life on the stages of San Francisco and Los Angeles. In the end, I did not get the part, but we had a fine time commenting in our letters on this unexpected intrusion of old Rome. And there was talk of a volume of Lovecraft's short stories being published in hardcovers, though he discounted the possibility, since it had more than once occurred and failed to materialise before. There seemed no reason why our stimulating and fruitful relationship would not go on indefinitely. 
Although he sometimes referred to himself as the old gentleman, Lovecraft had only become 46 years old on August the 20th. In my 47th year, was his way of putting it. His letters proved that his reserves of energy were prodigious. His interests fresh, his attitudes youthful. How many middle-aged men make friendships of the temperamental, unreserved, impractical sort by mail? To us, there was every indication that a long life remained to Lovecraft. Yet, there were disturbing hints that the situation was not quite like that. With more of a directness, my wife asked Lovecraft about his diet. The old gentleman obliged us with his college street menu. Chiefly coffee and a doughnut for breakfast, coffee and bread and cheese, or a small can of beans for supper. In the winter there was a brief hiatus in his replies. Then he wrote that he had been in hospital for a few days, but was out again and taking his regular walks, though in slippers or in shoes that had been cut out to accommodate his swollen feet. Again his replies ceased. In Los Angeles my wife and I hid our fears from each other. In the Louisville attic, where his family had been driven by the Great Ohio Flood that opened 1937 and destroyed a set of my splatter stencils, Harry Fisher noted down in a letter he had no way of sending me at the time that something must be done to provide Lovecraft with fresh vegetables. It was a little late for vitamins. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Gamwell informed us of her nephew's death. Only then did we realise that his letters to us newcomers were, beyond their other values, an example of truly smiling fortitude, of the enjoyment of life, in the face of the greatest adversity. Fresco, Spring, 1958. There you go. I hope you enjoyed that. I think that's quite a nice revealing bit of insight into uh, a very young man's correspondence with Lovecraft. So, yeah. Well, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I will speak to you soon. <laughs>